Hello everyone, today we are going to cover uh, chapter 4 of Merrill's uh, edition 14, which is on radiography, anatomy, and radiography of the abdomen. So let's begin with a quick review of anatomy. So the abdominal pelvic cavity extends from the diaphragm to what we call the bony pelvis. And it consists of two parts. You've got the abdominal cavity, which is the larger superior cavity, and then the pelvic cavity. In fact, notice the terminology. There's that combining vowel of O joining pelvis and abdomen. So we call it the abdominal pelvic cavity. It contains a lot. So we have the stomach, we've got the small intestine of, remember there are three parts. We've got the uh, duodenum or duodenum, the jejunum, and then the ilium. Ilium spelled with an E, not to be confused with ilium spelled with an I, which is a part of the uh, hip bone. We've got the large intestine, which we also call the colon, the liver, gallbladder, spleen, pancreas, and the kidneys. I'd like to mention too that sometimes you hear the terminology instead of a small intestine or large intestine, you hear a small bowel or a large bowel, and those terms are acceptable as well. The pelvic cavity contains the rectum, the sigmoid colon, the urinary bladder, and then reproductive organs. To support all of these different organs um, and to bring vasculature to them um, in some instances uh, is what we call the peritoneum. And the peritoneum is basically a double walled membranous sac that, as I mentioned, it encloses the cavity, it supports uh, the organs. We've got a layer of the peritoneum, which is the inner layer, which is called the visceral peritoneum. Now remember, Anytime you hear the term visceral, visceral refers to viscera, which is organs. So you've got this covering that's immediately um, on top of, I would say, the, the organs, actually uh, in contact with the organs. And then we've got an outer layer of the peritoneum, which is called the parietal peritoneum. So it's very similar to when we learned uh, the lungs, where you have the uh, visceral pleura, and uh, the parietal pleura. Okay, here we've got the visceral peritoneum and the parietal peritoneum. There's another term that we use, which is called uh, recto, or, I'm sorry, uh, retro peritoneum. Retro, of course, means behind. Okay, so retro peritoneal structures are any of those organs that lie behind the peritoneum. Uh, kidneys and pancreas, for example, lie in this space. We say that these structures are retro peritoneal structures. So here you've got a cross section of the abdominal cavity and you can see that uh, they're showing to you this peritoneum and then how it kind of invaginates into and between the organs and then supports uh, the organs. Uh, if you also take a look at this you can see this is obviously a male here. Uh, you've got anteriorly you've got in the pelvic region the uh, bladder and then you have posteriorly then the uh, rectum. So this was just a very brief explanation of the anatomy. Your book gives a, a whole lot more uh, detail. Uh, what I would like you to focus on, remember, is to uh, to go through the different parts of the stomach, for example, uh, noting that uh, there's three main parts to the stomach, right? You've got the fundus, uh, the body, and the pylorus uh, for the uh, small intestine, uh, which is the next part. You've got the uh, duodenum, jejunum, ileum. Uh, then you have the uh, colon. You should know all of the parts of the colon. We start out with the cecum. The appendix is attached to the cecum. Then we've got the ascending colon. Then we've got the hepatic flexure. We've got the transverse colon. We've got the splenic flexure. We've got the descending colon. We've got the sigmoid colon. We've got the rectum and we've got the anus. So you should know those. 
Uh, you should also know uh, some, a uh, little bit of the anatomy of the biliary system. Uh, biliary system, of course, is the gallbladder or liver. Uh, coming out of the liver, you've got your uh, two hepatic ducts, right and left. They join together to form the common hepatic duct. Uh, then you have uh, the cystic duct, which is going to lead into the gallbladder. Then you've got the common bile duct, which is going to then open up into a larger area called the ampulla vater, and then you've got the uh, sphincter of Odi, which is going to be that opening, which is going to allow bile that was either produced by the liver or stored by the gallbladder to enter into uh, the duodenal area. Uh, so there is a lot of anatomy, um, and as I mentioned, you know, in this uh, in this part of the lesson. I just like to, to know a little bit about it as we go into the different structures like stomach, colon, we'll learn much more about them. So refer to uh, pages 131 uh, uh, in your book. Um, you may have to supplement that by uh, looking at uh, Merrill's going to the section on the stomach, going to the section on the uh, colon, looking at the anatomy then on uh, those pages as well. Or, of course, um, I uh, had given to you in one of your modules numerous uh, videos to watch on the uh, different parts to the gastrointestinal tract, or as we say, the alimentary uh, canal. So with that, so let's move into the anatomy. Let's talk about some preliminary procedural guidelines. Uh, you've got patient preparation, exposure technique, image receptor size or collimated field size, the source to image receptor distance, uh, identification markers, how to properly use them, radiation protection, and then patient instructions. So as far as patient preparation is concerned, it notes here that preliminary preparation of the intestinal tract is important. However, I can tell you that if it's just a KUB, they're probably going to only, you know, uh, do the exam without any type of what is mentioned here, controlled diet, laxative, enemas. Um, in some instances, uh, the patient may have those uh, because what you're trying to do is rid the uh, bowel of any uh, feces or uh, any retained gas that may be in that area. But generally speaking, uh, if it's just ordered as a KUB, uh, there is no prep. Or if it's ordered as an obstruction series, which is an acute abdomen series uh, where you're going to do different views of the abdomen to see if there is an obstruction or any free air. Uh, oftentimes those patients are so sick, uh, you're not going to do any of these as well. But Merrill's does mention them, so I'm mentioning them, uh, control diet, uh, laxative, and enemas. As it mentions, preliminary preparation, as I said, is not administered to acutely ill patients or those with any suspected visceral rupture. Remember, viscera is an organ, any perforation or any obstruction. Uh, and of course, we remove any artifacts from the anatomy of interest and provide the patient with a gown. Exposure technique. When we're taking a look at the abdomen, we're really looking uh, for a lot of different uh, gray areas. If you, um, once again, I'm using the 14th edition of Maros. If you look on page 133, page 133, it gives you some sample techniques of what would provide, as it's mentioned here, a moderate gray scale. Okay? We don't want an image that's too contrasting, meaning too black and white. Um, I don't want um, an, a radiograph that's going to be way too gray where you don't see any differenti differentiation in tissue structures. So we need this moderate uh, gray scale. As it mentions, uh, KVP that's too high will over penetrate the structures. Other thing too, remember KVP, the higher you go, the more scatter radiation you get. Uh, so it's gonna make your image more and more gray. So on page 133, it gives you some sample techniques where an AP uh, 85 at uh, 25 mass if you're using CR, 85 at 10 mass if you're using uh, DR. Uh, if we look at the AP, the lateral decubitus, 85 at, for CR, it would be uh, 28. And if we're using uh, DR, it would be 11. 
uh, for a lateral decubitus down at the bottom there, 90 at 65 for CR or 90 at 25 for DR. Of course, in the lateral uh, decubitus position where you're shooting through much more tissue, you're going to have to use a much higher technique. So those are the uh, techniques I would like you to uh, to memorize. Now, of course, these techniques are not set in stone. If your different clinical sites are going to rotate through, you basically would use whatever technique they are uh, using. But as a tech, uh, you should know, you know these average tech, uh, technical uh, factors. Why is uh, exposure technique so important? Well, if you look at the bottom of pages 134 uh, and 135, you can see some sample uh, KUBs there. Okay, what do we want to see? Well, we want to see the lower border of the liver uh, on 134. It's almost like, and I always tell students, it's almost looks to me like uh, you have like sails coming down from the spine. These these structures that uh, come down from the spine, uh, they're they're dotted in there for you. That's the psoas muscles, the psoas major muscles. Uh, we've got the kidneys. They've dotted in the shadows of the kidneys there. Of course, you should see the ribs, the lower ribs. Those are basically the uh, lower ribs, the floating ribs there. And then coming out to the side of each vertebral body, you should see the transverse processes of the lumbar vertebrae. So those are going to be key indicators of whether you've got the right technique. If you can see those structures, uh, then you've got a good technique. As far as, far as the uh, IR or collimated field size, uh, the textbook does give you guidelines for those. Uh, use close collimated field to provide radiation protection, of course, and improve image quality. Radiation protection is very important here because if you look, um, uh, the bottom of your field in a male for a KUB, uh, you shouldn't have the, um, the testicles in the image. Okay, you should be below it, so your collimation would be very important. Unfortunately for the uh, female, the ovaries are in the pelvic cavity, and we do have to show uh, the pelvis, so unfortunately we do end up irradiating the ovaries. So trying to collimate and doing everything we can, you know, Alara-wise, to cut down on our exposure um, is very important. SID, uh, 40 inches. Okay, So it says when SID is not specified under a projection, then Maros suggests 40 inches. ID markers, you're going to use a right or left-sided marker. It's included on at least one of the projections. Uh, once again, you're going to see in the clinical site they're going to use digital annota annotation. Uh, Maros does not recommend it. Uh, ASRT doesn't recommend it either. Uh, you're supposed to be using your lead marker, so avoid using digital annotation to place side markers on images. Uh, other required ID markers must be in the blocker somewhere in the final image. Like if you're doing a decube, it should say somewhere on your image that you're doing a decube. Radiation protection, shield pediatric patients and patients of reproductive age. Uh, these page numbers may be off a little bit uh, because this was, uh, I believe, uh, a PowerPoint from the previous edition. But the uh, radiation guidelines are in the in the book. Uh, basically, it's, it's telling you to collimate and use a shield whenever you can, as long as it doesn't block the anatomy of interest. So close collimation and, of course, optimum technique factors or technical factors. You want to use the right technique. Uh, explain or demonstrate positions of possible exposures for abdominal procedures generally are made at the end of expiration. Very important. Abdominal radiography is end of expiration to avoid compression of the organs. So we tell the patient, take in a deep breath, blow all the air out, and hold it out, stop breathing. Let's move on to talking about these essential projections of the uh, abdomen. So the first one that we're going to talk about is going to be the AP supine and the upright position. Then we'll move on to the PA, the uh, left lateral decubitus, uh, the lateral right or left, and then uh, lateral right or left dorsal decubitus position. Three-way abdomen or acute abdominal series is a common request. Okay, So I want to make mention to you now that it is not normal for a healthy adult um, to have gas in the small intestine. 
okay that's not that's not where it should be okay there should be gas in the colon uh, there should be uh, some gas in the stomach but no gas um, in the uh, small intestine. So if the patient has a gas in the small intestine, that's indicating that there's a blockage somewhere and that gas which should be passing through the small intestine into the large intestine is being blocked. Okay, so uh, we say that the patient is then obstructed. What can happen as well is you could get a perforation in uh, part of the GI tract. Perforation meaning like a hole and any gas that should be contained within the walls of the alimentary canal is now escaping into the peritoneal cavity. And we call that free air. So a three-way abdomen, acute abdominal series, uh, also called an obstruction series, uh, common, common request because unfortunately uh, it's a common condition in a lot of patients. As I mentioned, it demonstrates air, uh, free air, which is called pneumoperitoneum or uh, air fluid levels, especially if the patient has uh, any ascites or fluid, uh, free fluid in the abdomen. And it generally consists of these three uh, projections, an AP supine, which is a, a basically called a KUB, an AP upright, which is going to show any free air under the diaphragm, or it will show air fluid levels, and then a PA chest, once again, you're taking a look right underneath the diaphragm where the radiologist is to make sure that there's no uh, free air there. Another common request is a two-way abdominal series. This might be your uh, AP supine and then an upright AP. Uh, for both procedures, a left lateral decubitus is performed in lieu of an upright if a patient cannot stand. Now, this is all going to depend on the site that you're at. Um, every site has a little bit different uh, set of projections that you're going to take uh, for an obstruction series. Uh, like at some places, it may be the three we mentioned, and it also includes a left lateral decubitus. In other places, if you can't do the upright, then you substitute a left lateral decubitus because a left lateral decubitus will also show you if there's any free air. So it, it, it's not set in stone as a routine, so you need to know the routine uh, when you get to uh, your clinical site. AP abdomen, note uh, the projections often referred to as a KUB, your kidneys, your ureters, and your bladder which is important because uh, you cannot clip the bladder uh, when you do a KUB, okay? If you clip any of the bladder, you gotta end up repeating your image. So let's talk about an AP uh, supine of the abdomen. This is shown to you, once again, Merrill's uh, the 14th edition on page 137. Patient is supine. Notice the legs are bent uh, to reduce any strain. Look at the central ray. The central ray, look at the pointer. The central ray is to the level of the iliac crest. You wanna make sure, look at the light field. If you've collimated correctly, the bottom of your light field should be uh, right at the symphysis pubis. Your central ray is perpendicular. There's no angulation and it enters the MSP at the level of the crest. So a KUB, central ray, MSP, level of iliac crest. We use a 14 by 17 uh, size image receptor. Uh, smaller patients, uh, column to one inch outside of the skin sh uh, shadow. Uh, hypersonic patients may require two crosswise projections. One, you're going to put crosswise to make sure that you get uh, the bladder up. And then the next one, you're going to overlap uh, by about an inch or so to make sure then you get the upper part of the abdomen. Uh, tall patients may require a separate bladder image. The upright is also shown to you on page 137. Uh, as I mentioned, a KUB with a KUB, which is the supine, you cannot clip the symphysis pubis. With the upright, it's okay to clip the symphysis pubis, but you cannot clip the diaphragm. Okay, so KUB, you cannot clip the symphysis. The upright, the AP upright, you cannot clip the diaphragm. So if we look at the picture there, patient is standing with back in contact with vertical grid. MSP is centered to the grid. The weight is equally distributed on both feet. Uh, IR is centered. Now notice the difference in the centering, two inches above the iliac crest, high enough to include the diaphragm. So KUB, 
you center at the iliac crest. For an upright abdomen, you center two inches above the iliac crest, still down the MSP. If the bladder is to be included on the upright for some reason, then you do need to center at the iliac crest. But as I mentioned, that's, that's usually not the case. Usually you're upright, you gotta include the diaphragm. Centralized horizontal, center to IR for diaphragm, uh, which is what you do in most cases, uh, entering MSP two inches above iliac crest. Collimated field is 14 by 17. And of course, if it's a smaller patient, you would collimate to a smaller field size. The PA abdomen upright. Uh, usually you, when you mention or talk about the PA upright, now this is shown to you on page 139. Uh, the PA reduces the gonadal dose and should be considered when kidneys are not of the primary interest, okay? Uh, you would not decide to do this on your own. You're gonna do whatever they tell you to do at your clinical site, but you sometimes see this question in review books. It might be on the registry as far as a radiation safety question. Uh, doing a PA is going to be safer, I'm putting that in quotes, uh, than the AP because the gonads are more anterior in the body. And remember, when you take an x-ray, even though you set up uh, 90 kVp, for example, 80 kVp, there's very few photons are, that are at that keV level. Remember, our, our beam is heterogeneous, many different uh, wavelengths and many of the photons that are coming out are going to be uh, very low energy photons. If we do a PA then, the buttocks then are going to absorb those low energy uh, photons. If we did AP, the gonads would be absorbing those low energy photons. Okay? But when we do these images, a lot of times the kidneys are of interest and therefore uh, when we can put the part of interest closer to the image receptor, we get better detail. Uh, once again, referencing page 139, uh, patient is uh, upright with anterior surface in contact for the PA, weight equally distributed on both feet, MSP is centered to the grid, and we're centering, again, two inches above the iliac crest. Look at the picture of the man there, figure 412 on 139. Uh, imagine where his iliac crests are, and then notice your central ray is two inches above that level. Uh, central ray is perpendicular, two inches above. Let's move on to the left lateral decubitus. This is also shown to you on page 139. Okay. It says, performed in place of an upright position for patients who are too ill to stand, okay? Very, very, very important, okay? When we do a decubitus and we're trying to assess for any free air, we do a left lateral decubitus. Here is the reason. When we lay our patients on, our left si on their left side, any free air in the abdomen is going to rise up to the right side of the body because air rises. And on the right side of your body is your liver. Your liver normally doesn't have any air. It shouldn't have any air in there. So you'd be able to see air, free air, uh, very nicely. If we did a right lateral decubitus and the patient has free air, it's going to rise up. And if we're doing a right, it's going to rise up to the left side. And that's going to be where the stomach is. And the stomach normally has gas in it anyways. And that gas then may obscure uh, the free air that may be in the abdomen. So we do left lateral decubitus so that any free air will rise up to the right side by the liver where there normally shouldn't be any air and we'd be able to see it much easier. So if you take a look at the picture of the person on 139, uh, recumbent left lateral on a radiolucent pad, you can build them up if you're looking for fluid so you don't clip off that uh, fluid side. Arms above the level of the diaphragm, knees are slightly flexed for stability. And notice the central ray positioning. You're still down the MSP, okay, if it's a thin person, and two inches above the iliac crest. What does that tell you? It should tell you that you cannot clip the diaphragm. You cannot clip the diaphragm. In fact, any free air, that's usually where it rises up 
uh, around that area. Uh, if you have a larger patient, a hypersthenic, and you are interested in looking for free air, you may not be able to center right at the MSP. You might have to center slightly above the MSP, uh, meaning toward moving the center right towards the side up so you do not clip the side up. Okay. So when we're looking for free air, we cannot clip the side up. This is in contrast to what we learned for the chest. When we were looking for fluid in the lungs, we cannot clip the side down because fluid falls. So you don't want to clip that. We don't want to clip the side up in an abdomen uh, to cube because generally we're looking for uh, free air. With that said, if for some reason they were looking for fluid in the abdomen, well, then you wouldn't want to clip the side down. But generally speaking, we don't want to clip the side up. So once again, uh, with the lateral uh, decubitus and vertical grid device aligned uh, or centered to align long axis of the image receptor with the MSP, your central ray is horizontal and perpendicular to the center of the IR. Remember, what determines a decube? A decube is determined when the beam is in a horizontal uh, position. You're, you're aiming uh, perpendicular, or I'm sorry, uh, parallel to the uh, floor basically with your tube. Okay, so we, we use a horizontal beam. Of course, we're going to use a collimated field, 14 by 17, and then uh, smaller patients, uh, you can, of course, collimate to a smaller uh, area. A lateral of the abdomen. Uh, the lateral of the abdomen is shown to you on page 141, once again, the 14th edition. Uh, here we've got the patient in a lateral. Now, it looks very similar to what we just saw in the decubitus position, but what makes the difference here is look at your tube. Your tube is not, uh, the beam's not coming in horizontal. Now you're coming in vertically with your beam. Look at the pointer, which represents the central ray. So we flex the knees for stability. We flex the elbows, place the hands under the head. Uh, once again, what is this telling you? Because you're centering two inches above the iliac crest, the level of the crest, you don't want to clip the diaphragm. When we look at that uh, radiograph there, you can see uh, the right lateral of the abdomen, okay, and uh, you can see they're showing you this patient has uh, a graft there, an aortic um, graft. You can see calcification in the aorta as well. So your central ray is perpendicular, entering mid-coronal now, not mid-sagittal, mid-coronal from the side. A level of crest or two inches above the crest if you want to look at the diaphragm. We use a 14 by 17, and then we collimate to a smaller size if it's a smaller patient. Let's turn the page then to 142 and talk about the dorsal decubitus. So let's say... Uh, you had a patient, really, really sick patient. Uh, you couldn't do the upright, they couldn't stand. Uh, for some reason, maybe they had surgery or for some other reason, you can't lay them on their left side. And you're trying to assess if there's any uh, free air. Uh, one of your choices that you might do is a dorsal decubitus. This is shown to you on 142. So if you reason it out, once again, fluid falls, air rises. So in a dorsal decube, if there was any free air, you would see that free air then along the anterior surface of the abdomen. So if you look at the picture of the uh, man on the cart there on 142, uh, patient is supine on uh, the cart with the right or left side in contact with the vertical grid device. Arms are crossed on the upper chest or behind the head. We support the knees for comfort and our central ray is two inches above the iliac crest uh, to the image receptor. We adjust the height on the vertical grid device to align to the long axis of the uh, IR with the mid um, the coronal plane MCP. Central ray is horizontal and perpendicular to center of IR enters MCP two inches above the iliac crest. So once again, we're not wanting to clip the diaphragm. Look at the radiograph. You can see uh, very nicely the diaphragm there. Uh, we collimate to 14 by 17. And then if it's a smaller patient, of course, we collimate to a smaller field size. 
So let's look at this question here. Which of the following might be used to demonstrate a pneumoperitoneum? So a pneumoperitoneum, remember, is basically a fancy word for free air, right? Uh, can you see free air in the upright? We can. Can you see a, a free air in the left lateral decubitus? We can. And can you see it on the dorsal decubitus? We can. So the answer then would be all of those. All of those could be used to demonstrate a pneumoperitoneum. To include the diaphragm on upright positions, AP projections of the abdomen, the central ray is center. Take a look at your choices. Hopefully you didn't say the iliac crest. <clears throat> Hopefully you said A, two inches above the iliac crest. We don't want to clip the diaphragm. Well, let's move on to looking at some of the images. So, of course, whenever in radiography you take an image, you want to make sure that you look at the image and then you're going to critique it because you got to know whether you need to repeat it or not. So on the supine abdomen, so once again, I'd invite you to look back uh, to the AP uh, abdomen x-ray. This is at the bottom of 138. You should see proper collimation area from pubic symphysis to upper abdomen. Two images may be necessary if the patient's tall or wide, as we talked about. Proper patient alignment. How are you going to know this? The vertebral column should be right down the middle of your radiograph. Uh, ribs, pelvis, hips equidistant to the edge of the image receptor or collimated borders of your image. Shouldn't have any rotation of the patient. You're going to look to the spinous processes. Now, the spinous processes, if you look, you look to the body of your vertebrae, it almost looks like little. Uh, the teardrops coming down the middle of the body. So those are your spinous processes, and they should be right in the center of that uh, rectangular structure, which is then uh, the body of the vertebrae. Uh, the ischial spines. Okay, you can't really see the ischial spines uh, on this uh, patient. Your ischial spines, um, if you see them, and I'd invite you uh, to uh, take a look at uh, your anatomy uh, text if you have one, or you can Google a picture of the pelvis and look at the iliac, uh, I'm sorry, the ischial spines, okay? There are almost two little triangular structures that come out uh, from, the, uh, from the bones and they enter into this uh, widened area of where the bladder is going to be. Uh, if you see them, okay, you should see both of them. If you only see one of them, the patient's pelvis is rotated. Um, or in some patients, you don't see either, either one of them. Okay, it just depends on the construction of the patient's pelvis. So the point being is that you should either see both of them or you should not see any of them, either of them. Uh, if you see one of them, the patient's rotated. Okay. And then the ala or the wings of the ilia, that's your, your pelvic wings coming up. They should look symmetric. They should look alike. If one is narrowed, one is wider, that patient is rotated. Soft tissue brightness and contrast show the following. You should see the lateral abdominal wall and the uh, properitoneal fat layer, the psoas muscles, lower border of liver and kidneys, the inferior ribs, the transverse processes of the lumbar vertebrae, and you should have a right or a left marker, but not overlying any of the abdominal contents. Uh, so when we look at 138, we can see on that radiograph there, they have put a right marker on. Uh, this image is uh, presented correctly in that the right side of the radiograph is on my left side. So here's a KUB. So here you should be able to identify uh, the uh, kidney bean shaped structures, which are the kidneys. Uh, look to see those teardrop structures down the middle of the uh, vertebrae. You should look at the wings of the ilia. They are symmetric. Okay. Now on this patient, <clears throat> I can see, and uh, I'm going to see if I can uh, point this out here, this little structure here and this little structure here. These are these triangular structures, these little tiny, uh, almost faintly seen triangular structures. Uh, those are the ischial spines, and you should see them symmetric. And here we do. We see them as being equal. Um, as I mentioned, you can see the 
uh, going right down the middle, the spinous processes, and then off to the sides, we should see the transverse processes of the vertebrae. Uh, here is the psoas major muscle on both sides. Uh, you can see the uh, kidney bean shaped structures, which are the kidneys. Uh, here is the very large liver, this whitened area. It's absorbing a lot of radiation, so it's showing up a little bit whiter. And of course, these are the uh, ribs coming down. Let's move on to the upright. Okay, so your upright image is shown to you on page 138 as well. Now, right off the bat, I can tell that that second radiograph B is an upright. Why? Because you see what are called air fluid levels. When you have air and fluid within the uh, gastrointestinal tract, you're going to have a leveling off. It's, it's going to almost be like a flat line. That's the fluid. And then you're going to have the gas kind of uh, puffing up then basically from that uh, area. Okay, that's an air fluid level. Anytime you see air fluid levels, that's going to be an upright abdomen. You will not see air fluid levels on a KUB. So evidence of proper collimation, same criteria as the supine. Brightness and contrast similar uh, on the upright to the supine. And once again, you should have a marker indicating that it is upright. Okay, so in addition to your right marker, you'd have to put uh, that it is upright. So here we go. Those arrows are pointing to uh, what I said, those, those flattened areas. Those are the fluid levels. Uh, these are the air fluid levels. Notice they've clipped the symphysis pubis, and that's okay. Well, remember on the upright, what you cannot clip is the diaphragm. PA abdomen upright evaluation criteria, basically the same as for the upright projections. You had to do a PA, for example. Let's talk about the left lateral decubitus. So first of all, look at the bottom of 139. There is your patient in the left lateral decubitus. Now, before we talk about the image, how do I know that patient is in a left lateral decubitus? Well, they're in a lateral position. They're laying on their left side. The image receptor is behind the patient's back, and we're using a horizontal beam, so a left lateral decubitus. The image of the left lateral decubitus is on page 140. So what we should see is evidence of proper collimation, diaphragm without motion. We should see both sides of the abdomen. If the abdomen's too uh, wide, uh, remember you don't want to clip the side up for free air or side down if there's any suspected fluid. Uh, abdominal wall, flank structures, and diaphragm should be seen. So everything is labeled there uh, for you. Uh, no rotation of patient. So even though it's a decube, you don't want to have any rotation. And sometimes it's very difficult, especially with patients uh, that are very ill. Uh, we're trying to position them in as true a lateral as possible. So the spinous process, you should be in the center of the lumbar vertebrae, ischial spine symmetric again. Uh, wings of the ilium or wings of the uh, ilia should be symmetric, wings of the pelvis. Appropriate brightness and contrast to demonstrate the abdominal contents. And once again, proper identification is visible. Um, look at the indication here. This is a left lateral. They've marked, they used a right marker, but they've marked the right side. Remember the rule is correct marker on correct side. Um, so even though it's a left lateral decubitus, they marked uh, the side up with an R. And they put an arrow indicating that this is the side that is up. Okay, so there is the radiograph. Uh, one thing that I would like to draw your attention to is this area right in here, okay? This little straight line right here of darkness, okay? That's free air, okay? That should not be there. This is a very uh, sick patient. Uh, uh, there's, a, there's a hole in their uh, viscous somewhere. Uh, their organ and it's allowing gas to escape. Now it looks like this patient probably is post-surgical, uh, so that may be uh, air from the surgery, okay, um, but uh, probably this patient is not feeling very, very good at all, okay. They have put a right marker indicating the side that is then up. Let's look at a lateral abdomen on page 141. Okay, even though there's a symbol indicating in murals that this is a commonly performed 
uh, procedure, I would probably say it's not so common uh, if you compare it to uh, just a regular KUB or an obstruction series. But anyways, uh, let's take a look at what Merrill says. Evidence of proper collimation, uh, appropriate brightness and contrast, no rotation of patient demonstrated by superimposed ilia. So the wings of the ilium should be superimposed. Superimposed lumbar vertebra pedicles, which are the sides um, of the vertebra, and open intervertebral foramina. Okay, remember when we learned chest radiography, we saw those black holes, those black spaces, those were the intervertebral foramina. If you look at the radiograph on 141, you should see those uh, being presented as well. And we should see um, as much of the abdomen as is possible. Okay, so when we look at this then, uh, we look at the radiograph, we can see a uh, very nice uh, shaped uh, vertebrae as far as the bodies and then those intervertebral foramina uh, behind. Here is the radiograph. Um, so intervertebral uh, foramina again, uh, that would be uh, these little structures right in here. Okay. Uh, notice you're seeing the vertebrae from the side, nice rectangular structures. And uh, we should see as much of the abdomen as possible. So if this is a very hypersthetic patient, their abdomen comes way out. I gotta make sure that I don't clip that as well. Um, but you gotta see the back as well, so you don't wanna clip the spine. So it can be a little bit tricky in a hypersthetic patient. The dorsal decubitus is then the last one uh, that we'll talk about here. Look on page 142 of uh, the 14th edition of Merrill's again. Um, of course, we're using volume one for all of these. Uh, take a look at the radiograph. Patient is laying on their back. Look at the central ray to the mid-coronal plane. This is a thin patient. Now, if this were a hyperstenic patient, once again, you'd have the center a little bit higher than that level so you don't clip the anterior part of the abdomen because that's where the free air is going to be. Uh, so proper collimation diaphragm without uh, motion, appropriate brightness and contrast, demonstrating abdominal contents. And then patient is elevated, so the entire abdomen is shown. Once again, if they are interested in fluid, you cannot clip the side down. Here's a radiograph um, of that uh, patient. Uh, you can see here is the, up here, uh, the top is the anterior part, excuse me, of the abdomen and you haven't clipped it, and that's going to be very important. So let's look at this question, <clears throat> projection, position. Uh, so I'm noticing there's an arrow there. Well, that's going to tell me that that's going to probably be a decube position. Okay, it's, it's the right side up. Uh, so this is going to be then the uh, D, the AP, the left lateral decubitus. And once again, we're seeing, again, that free air the free air uh, on the right side of the patient, and that's where the liver is going to be. There shouldn't be any air up there, uh, so this is a left lateral decubitus. Let's look at this projection. Okay. Well, it's what we just uh, looked at. It's a, uh, a lateral, okay, but it's a dorsal decubitus. The patient is laying on their back. Okay. Now, what does the left indicate here? That means that the left side is closest to the bucky. And here then we've got a uh, image showing you the, uh, what we mentioned, the air fluid levels, those straight line patterns with the gas uh, kind of puffing up there. Okay, so that's gonna be your AP upright. We look at this one. This is a plain AP supine, it's a KUB. Okay, so AP supine. Uh, once again, uh, structures of interest. Uh, when we look at this, um, we're seeing then the uh, psoas major muscles. They're coming down from the spine. Okay, we're seeing the. Uh, here's one kidney here. There's another kidney right here. Uh, we're seeing the spinous processes. Oops, I can't do this exactly right. They're lined up right in the middle. I'm a little bit off there. Uh, the transverse processes coming off to the side. Uh, I can see ischial spine here, ischial spine here, so no rotation. 
This is a well-positioned AP supine. When we look at this one, okay, I'm seeing a lateral presentation of the abdomen. Okay, there's no indication that this is a decubitus position. So this is going to be a right uh, lateral, just a, simply a right lateral. There's no decubitus here. We're not seeing an arrow indicating it's the side up or anything, right lateral. 